We challenged ourselves to shoot 20 short films in 20 days and pulled it off. Check out our previous episodes to hear about the why we did it and how we shot them, what gear we used. In this episode, we're going to talk about... For this project, Post was mainly about editing and revising and editing and revising. Editing can be very time consuming. And for these films, we had a very limited amount of time. And to make it even more challenging, we didn't even edit in our studio. Because of the long hours, I set up an editing station at my house. By the way, these are really great and affordable studio monitors. It's often said you never actually finish a film, you just abandon it, which I can definitely attest to. So sometimes, time constraints can be a good thing. But hold on, before I get too far ahead, I need to go back and briefly touch on the production part again. Each day I woke up not knowing exactly what I was going to do. Yeah, I jotted down some ideas beforehand, but they were just really general. So I had to go with the flow of each day. For example, the first movie I did, Skateland, Took my kids and some of their friends skating. Boom, there's a short film. Nouveau. I had a client video job at a hotel. In between working on their project, I shot stuff for this. Also did the Lusitania short there. Ten thousand steps. Had an editing gig at a client's office. I wear a Fitbit every day, so I tried to tell that story. By the way, I really planned to hit ten thousand steps, but I didn't. So I improvised that ending. So each day I would shoot the iPhone video during my normal work day, then come home after work, eat dinner, have some family time, and then start editing about 7.30. With the goal of being done by midnight. That didn't always happen. So now with the production setup out of the way, let's move on to the editing, the post-production. First thing, the gear I used. A MacBook Pro, a couple year old one actually, and an HP monitor connected via HDMI. When I'm doing serious editing, to me it's imperative to have a larger screen. My studio computer is a 27 inch iMac. So having this external HP monitor connected to the laptop makes it feel like a desktop setup. I use this Bluetooth keyboard, but to be honest, I much prefer a larger keyboard when I'm editing, a traditional keyboard like the one back at my office. I didn't bring that one to my house because I also was working at my office during the day often. It's also nice to have the keys color-coded for the editing app you're using. This keyboard is actually for Premiere Pro, although I used Final Cut Pro for this project. And then I mentioned these monitors earlier, these speakers. Headphones work fine too, but I like to mix to speakers to a room. And these reference monitors were great. And they're only about a hundred bucks. So really affordable for any home studio. I'm a simple man. Don't wanna complicate ya. Uh, complicate ya. Uh. Wanted to quickly talk about LumaFusion. We did not use LumaFusion on this. We used Final Cut Pro 10. We know a lot of you guys that watch this channel use LumaFusion. And we do too, but not for this kind of project. Not yet anyway. They just announced a new update to export XMLs so you can essentially use it as an offline editor and then master back in Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro. And they also announced external HDMI monitoring from an iPad or an iPhone, which is great. Understand, we think LumaFusion is great. It is professional level software and an incredible value, an incredible price. 
Although for this kind of work, for narrative or commercial work, we would typically edit on our desktop or laptop systems. But we do highly recommend LumaTouch. Okay, so I'm going to open up Final Cut Pro 10 here. And this, of course, is the full project of everything that I edited. You can see over here I have each day in its own event, each short film. Now this is not going to be an in-depth Final Cut Pro 10 tutorial. just want to give you an overview of how I structured the project, how I did the daily editing. So if you take a look here, I have each day, and I created folders within those and saved all the files for each day. File management is really important when you're editing larger projects. I also have a folder for sound effects, project backups, music. We'll talk about music in a moment. And then my exports for each day. And then the thumbnail is really important for YouTube. I would export a ProRes master of each file, and then I would compress MP4 for YouTube. This is one reason that I prefer editing in Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro because of the higher quality codecs. You shoot on the iPhone in MPEG-4, but then I edit in a ProRes timeline that's 422 color space. And so anytime you render or add color grading, etc., then you're not degrading the footage as much. One of the reasons I used Final Cut Pro 10 on this project, and I had never used Final Cut Pro 10, by the way, been Premiere Pro and Avid editor for a long time. And the number one reason I wanted to try it was the way Apple does this skimming here and does the playback of 4K. The 4K iPhone files, for whatever reason, do not play well on Premiere Pro. And my computer is a later model computer and I have pretty fast hard drives. So the way Final Cut Pro handles the files makes it much easier for playback and you don't have to do proxy files. So for most of these shorts, I would do a rough edit, and this is what I would do on any project, unless you're doing a music video where you're cutting to the beat. I would do a rough edit of the piece, and then I would add the music in. Then I would do color correction, and very importantly, sound design. I'll touch on both those here more in a minute. You'll notice in most of these, I letterbox them. The footage was not actually shot widescreen. It was shot 16 by nine in most cases, but I repositioned it. Like for instance here, I pulled it down. And then when you put the letterbox back on, it hides the reframe. This was shot 120 frames per second in HD. Now, a lot of these I shot in 4K, but the ones I shot in 4K, I went ahead and mastered in 4K. But it's nice sometimes to shoot 4K for working in 1080 because then you can push in and out without loss of quality. So let me go back to show you an example of the color correction I did. So on the right hand side over here you have the different effects. Custom LUT, color board, and magic bullet looks are the ones I used. I'll turn each one of these off. You can see the original footage. So there's the original shot. Shot with Filmic Pro in 4K flat. So I went in and added the custom LUT and the LUTs I used were the ones that we designed and made for Filmic Pro. And I just used the standard iPhone log to Rec 709. And our log LUT works great with flat, by the way. You just adjust the mix here, adjust the slider there, and this one's full. So in Final Cut, you can use the RGB Parade. You can use a waveform. And you can see here the colors are good. Red, green, and blue are all even. You also have color wheels, which is nice now in Final Cut Pro 10. The color board is so-so. The wheels are nice though, and you can add green, blue, whatever you want. And then the last plugin I used on this was Magic Bullet Looks. This is a third-party plugin from Red Giant that just adds a little punch to it, just adds a little bit of a film look to it. There's a lot of different plugins on the market. I use a lot of Magic Bullet and I also use Film Convert. Let me go look at one more example. Winter Forest, I shot this in 4K. This was a nice chilly morning and there was fog. You can see the fog in the distance there. 
There's the original footage. Oh, and this also is not widescreen. I letterboxed it. You can see I shifted the image up there at the bottom of the frame. So I added the letterbox, and then I went in and added a LUT. And then in the color board, I had lifted the mids, and I lowered the contrast and turned it black and white and came up with what I think is a pretty nice look. Did some motion tracking on the text here. So basically I used Crumple Pop Easy Point Tracker and tracked the text to the, to the objects, to the bikes. And then again, I used a, a mat here. You can see it on and off, shot all this 16 by nine. This is all 120 frames per second in HD. Most of the stuff was just cuts, but occasionally I did add effects, usually speed ramps like that one. This is a luminance dissolve. You can see how it grabs the clouds or the sky, the luminance before it and creates a nice effect. And then the last thing I would do is sound design and sound design is really important. It's important on anything you do, but especially these kind of stylized films. And a lot of these sound effects are just built into Final Cut, which is really nice. Up here on the left hand side, and you can search for whatever you want. Wind, whoosh. Yeah, there's a lot of whooshes. All these right down here. Those are all sound effects. And this reminds me that the music we used is stock music for the most part. The art list we use, Epidemic Sound. And importantly, we also use a lot of YouTube now. YouTube has free music and sound effects. If you didn't know that, look in your creator studio. Earlier I mentioned the monitors I used. They are the Mackie CR3 monitors and mixing. Don't mix on your laptop. That is not a good way to do it. Now it's good to listen to it on your laptop because a lot of people watch videos and such on laptops. But when you're mixing, do it with something that has a little bit of fidelity that gives you a clear idea of what the project, what the music sounds like. And the final step of the process would be to take your project and export it. And I mentioned ProRes earlier, and that's one reason that I like using desktop or laptop systems. I edit it in ProRes, and then so I would export in ProRes too. And the really cool thing about doing that is once Final Cut Pro renders everything, which it kind of does along the way, it will export these big 4K files or HD files almost instantly. In other editing software, exporting takes a lot longer. So that's another nice thing about Final Cut Pro 10. ProRes 3840 by 2160, that's UHD 4K. QuickTime shows you the size. This would be 3.06 gigabyte. It's a master file. And then I would hit next and you choose where it's going. I'm not gonna do this right now, I've already done it. And then you would hit go and it would export the file. And then from there, I would use Media Encoder to do the MP4s for YouTube. You can do MP4 out of Final Cut Pro. I don't find them to be as clean. I also have Compressor from Apple on here and Compressor doesn't work as well for me either. And there's a YouTube preset that I went in and modified. And then you would render. And from there, upload. So ultimately, I tried to take normal everyday stuff, sometimes mundane stuff, and tell a story or make it visually interesting. And really these were all done as a test. Shooting on iPhones is great, but it's not necessarily as easy, especially trying to use different accessories. It can be finicky. The best way to learn how to use equipment is to do it in a real world setting. So as I've said in the previous episodes, technology is great, but don't let it bog you down. Use the technology the best you can to help you make films. So get an idea, grab your smartphone and go make a film. Don't forget to check out these short films on our channel. Also, please subscribe if you haven't already, and we will see you guys in the next video.